the time? Yes, overdue. Good. Uh, welcome to this uh, Meet the Debian Technical Committee buff. Um, it's intended to be a buff, so don't hesitate if you have questions or remarks or other type of communications with us. Uh, we have a small presentation, so I'll, we'll start with that, but if you have questions, don't hesitate. Um, so the current Debian TC members are mostly all here uh, on stage. I'll start in order. So we have Keith, uh, myself as chair, uh, Tolef, Sam, Phil, Margarita, Marga, David, and Nico Tini, he's unfortunately at home, couldn't attend DebConf, but hi, he's probably following up on the video stream. Um, but what is the technical committee uh, all in all? You probably all read the Debian constitution more than once, and you know that the 6.1 chapter talks about the technical committee and what it does. Um, the technical committee may um, has a, a set of powers, and one of these is to decide on any matter of technical policy. It does also decide on any technical matter where developers' jurisdictions overlap and make a decision when asked to do so. It's uh, subtitled as a uh, tie-breaking. And it can also, according to 614, overrule a developer, but it requires a three to one majority. So we also act as a last resort body. Um, we can override developers. But we can also offer advice. The 615 um, point in the constitution does that. And we are bound by a certain set of constraints. Um, 633 says that we have to have public discussion and decision making. 635 said we cannot do detailed design, design work. And 636 says that the Debian Technical Committee makes decisions only as last resort after all attempts to resolve the problem via consensus have been tried and failed. If I quote that correctly by heart. Um, we're also constitutionally asked to break ties amongst available options. So we are picking options that are on the table and we're not supposed by the constitution to come up with solutions ourselves. So after all effort to resolve it via consensus have been tried and failed, that's what I just said. We can also offer advice and make our views known. Uh, so that, that also means that the TC can offer you advice if you have a technical problem or uh, uh, as something related to Debian in general that you want advice on, we are the one of the bodies you can go to if you want advice, how you want to handle that technical problem. So in short, um, the Debian Technical Committee is a self-nominated and DPL appointed, last resort, conflict resolution and advice providing body. It's very beautiful. Um, we'll come back to the self-nominated and DPL appointed points later. Um, it's been a tradition of the technical committee buff to review the issues we've had since the previous DebConf. So if you want to see the, the previous, previous issues, you have to go watch uh, last year's buff. But for this year, so uh, we've went through the issues that we have had in front of the technical committee since the last DebConf. And actually, uh, when I wrote the slides initially, I thought, oh, we only had two or three issues. Actually, it was not exactly the case. Um, We've had six membership bugs, so to say. Um, we track all the decisions we take through bug reports. So we've had three new members in the persons of Marga, then Bremner, then Nico. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have decided uh, as internal procedure that Every time the membership changes, so whenever someone leaves or when someone joins, we have another vote to decide on the TC chair. Um, it's the constitution doesn't require us to do that, but we do it as a matter of not having to ask for a vote for the chair. And so far I've had the honor to be elected every time as chair. So that means I'm preparing the slides. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've categorized the decisions we have had in our, in our hands in two categories. And the first one is how the issues we have actually decided. So it's three issues in which we have actually have a vote, had a vote on it, and we have closed the issue after a formal resolution. There was a, how did, should the TC help with a project roadmap? 
to which we have answered that uh, we are ready to help to break ties, but that we don't really want AZTC to be the body doing a project roadmap directly. I don't know if any of you guys want to comment on that, or I just go up, go on and yeah. you interrupt us, me. Uh, there was the blends task must not be priority important. That was um, conflict within the Debian installer where, um, if I remember correctly, the um, task system, the priority system was used to make sure blends could be installed through the Debian installer. And we have done some mediation there and recommended that, uh, well, we did a recommendation on how the problem should be handled. It was solved in by other means, but we acted as a recommendation there. And then quite recently, uh, as was already highlighted by the, the DPL, we had the question of whether we should rename Node.js back to Node, uh, which uh, we managed to take a decision quite quickly saying, well, the namespace is free again, so Node.js might as well be named Node. So we answered yes. There was actually seven bugs that were closed without a formal resolution, and we just discussed that in, in within the TC, and, and it's quite surprising that we are happy to close issues without formal resolution, where our main constitutionally required way to take decisions is to have actual votes. But there are plenty of cases where it, it makes sense to not go through an actual vote where it's obvious that we have consensus, and we don't have to go through the administrativia of doing an ex an, an explicit vote and having a lengthy resolution and wording and all that. So there are these seven bugs. We close them without having to take a vote. So we had two about browserified JavaScript and the uh, DFSG2. Um, so the first bug, we clarified the responsibilities and bounced that back to the FTP master and did that again a second time. Um, there was a please cl clarify that CSV and its support decision is not going to expire. We refused to rule on that, saying, yeah, well, what I just said, we refused to decide on that. Um, we had a longer one overruling the maintainer of the global package to package a new upstream version in time for stretch. And the result of that discussion was that the maintainer of the global package orphaned the package, so the the problem disappeared so that the package became free for adoption for someone else to actually do the packaging of the new upstream version. We had uh, to decide a, on a proper solution for the binutils MIPS bug. Actually, it was, um, it was a bug in, um, in binutils where, uh, if I remember correctly, the, it, the new version was creating failure to build from source for some MIPS, bug for, for some MIPS packages. So we did some mediation there, and it, the, the solution was found <laughs> <laughs> without us having to vote. <laughs> um, we had another request to clarify that uh, USR bin foo should not be hard coded, in, even in upstream parts. We had a quick discussion and also declined to rule in that case. And then the browserified JavaScript issue came back in, in another form. Um, st the question of supporting configuration file changes between the versions in unstable and testing, and it was obvious that uh, it was obvious for us that the issue didn't need a resolution from us because it was consensual enough within the project that we didn't have to rule. Any questions, remarks so far? Is it boring? I'll just go on then. <laughs> And actually, we have one currently open issue that is uh, advice on dealing with grub upgrade failure caused by init select. It's a question by Colin Watson about how to handle configuration files of abandoned packages or of disappearing packages, but because if you don't purge a package, some configuration files can stay on the system, but they can be hurtful for other packages. So there was a question whether it's OK in terms of policy for uh, Grub to take over a, a configuration file from another package that has disappeared from the archive. And we have consensus that it's okay to do it and it, that's not uh, hurting, it's not against policy, but we still need to actually close the bug saying that. We have consensus that it's okay in my case. We have consensus that it's okay in this case, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to 
really thank Colin for what a nice bug that was and how well presented it was. And every option was laid out. If you want to get a quick decision from us, if you do something like that, it'll go much better than if you start shouting at the start. <laughs> Eight six five nine two nine. I hope it's correct. You can always go to bugs. He deserves a round of applause for that. Actually, it was really yeah. good. You can always go to the technical committee bug report page where you see all the current bugs. In case. So, um, so that, that that was for the the current issues we have. Um, another subject we want to talk about is that we are often looking for new members. That is, um, in the constitution now since four years, I think, we have uh, the term expiry in the 627 uh, point. I'll just read that out loud. So on January 1st of each year, the term of any committee member who has served more than 42 months and who is one of the two most senior members is set to expire on December 31st of that year. You actually need to read that multiple times and write the formulas down <laughs> to actually understand what it means. <laughs> so I did the calculus for you. What it means is that um, Keith's term will expire at the end of this year, but as it, he, it's the only term that will expire, we only have one person who leaves. But next year there are three terms, so my term, Tolef's term and Sam's term that expire at the end of 2018, but only the two first ones will expire because we expire at most two per year. And so that that's the, these are the dates of the expiration. We also notice that if Tolef or myself resigns during 2018, we force Sam to expire as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, it's not a loophole, but it was just funny to discover. So we, we need fresh blood. Thank you for the evil laugh. Um, that means we're looking for at least one new member per year. So we are still on the. Uh, so this year we will have we will need one, but next year we'll need two. And the r regular rhythm is that we need two person, two new persons per year, actually. Um, and not all issues are like seven two seven seven zero eight. Who knows what that bug is? <laughs> System D, yes. It's actually a. Um, bug tracker load tester. <laughs> I think it's still the longest bug ever. It was something like 7,000 7, mails, something like that. So don't go and read it, it's way too long. So we want to quickly talk about what, what actually our work, the, what the TC work is about, uh, because we want to find uh, new members, at least one before the end of this year, ideally. So our work is often more social than technical. It's also about disagreements and conflicts by construction. I mean, that's, that's what we do, is like solving conflicts. It's at the broad technical level, so uh, you don't have to be a C expert. I'm definitely not. <laughs> um, but you have to be able to have a wider view on how Debian works and how the different things interact with each other and yeah, have a good understanding of what Debian is. It's about listening to what people have to say. So it's, the name is technical committee, but actually it's uh, often about what the people are doing and what their, uh, what their opinions are about the technical problems. It's also sometimes taking hard decisions. As was outlined before, we can override developers. It's not a fun thing to do, but we, if we have to do it, then we'll do it. And all in all, it's essentially political. So in Debian terms, of course, we're not talking about the wider society problems, but it's, it's still how people interact with each other, how they collaborate as humans, and, and all that. And the required skill set to come in the, in the technical committee, you don't have to tick all the, all the boxes, but that kind of gives you an idea of what types of people we're looking for. So you need to have some empathy, technical agility, so the ab ability to like dive in, in a technical area that you don't necessarily know, but be able to get an understanding of that problem, some sense of mentorship, um, ideally some responsiveness, so that we don't let the bugs die in limbo because no one has time to, to answer or even read the mails that are sent to the technical committee. 
some social sensitivity and ideally you should be cool-headed because the issues can can flame up slightly so it's it's good if you can take a step back and take a look at the wider view and approach the problems with a cool head one important point is that we need more diversity we're all white we have one woman and a lot of us are native English speakers, I'm not, but we're still, it's 50-50 for now, which is not the best situation to be in. So we definitely more need more diversity. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things we also, as we were discussing this earlier, uh, we have a lack of diversity in, I think, you know, we're all closer to, um, Older school programmers, in, in a certain way, um, you know. I think, as, as it was pointed out, there's perhaps overrepresentation of Emacs Lisp on the technical committee, as composed to, uh, say, the latest um, in GUI in GUI uh, IDEs and graphical design um, environments for code. Uh, you know, we probably write make files more than we drag and drop build systems. And actually, that's not a good thing. Just to, I mean, to follow up on, <laughs> <laughs> to follow. I, I mean, I okay. We all have a certain machismo, I guess. But uh, to follow up on DDA's point, you don't have to be an old school programmer to be on the technical committee. Right. We need more diversity. Then. Well, to to resolve the Node.js issue, it would have been lovely if we'd had somebody on the TC who'd actually ever programmed in Node.js, <laughs> for instance. So I'm teaching it in September, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll start programming it in October? <laughs> and uh, so we need diversity, but we also need nominees. And um, the current process is that you should write to the technical committee, private alias, or any of us, saying, I think this person would be good, or saying, I think I'm a good person. Uh, because we also want to pick from a set of good candidates and if the set is too small then it's really hard for us to just blankly blank accept whoever is the poor soul that got nominated there's a question at the back of the room I don't know if we have microphones how big was the set do we want to say that Five or thereabouts. So the question was uh, how much, how big was the set, and uh, the answer is about five. So my understanding is that um, we've uh, decided, over at least on this side of the um, the room, that we need a, a better nominations process. And um, Keith's leaving, and I tried to convince Keith to, to handle this, but you know, he wasn't willing to do that. Um, so. Um, you know, kind of in the wedding bouquet style, um, I have this ball here, and I'm going to throw it out into the audience, and <laughs> you should consider yourself empowered to optionally uh, give us a nomination and pass the ball along. <laughs> <laughs> I actually suspected that might happen, and I think that, is, that shows... Um, it is a little bit challenging to uh, fill the TC spot. We are already nominated. The trouble is, of course, that this is not at all diverse because you all came to De DevConf. And so you know loads of people that come to DevConf and they're much more likely to get nominated and all that. I did do a thing where I was randomly selecting people and sending them emails doing this. 
in the previous round, and it didn't really bear fruit, but it would be really nice if people could come up with uh, nominations because there's this thing about uh, groups of people knowing more people that know lots of people than... So it, the idea was that if you select someone from the community at random, they will know someone that's quite representative of them who knows lots of people, which is quite a good sort of mix for the technical committee. For the record, the ball eventually did hit Doko, and that was the <laughs> final target. Um, so, Phil, I, I am very confused. I thought your random thing, like, was the best enhancement to the nomination process ever. I thought, um, like, I think it actually did substantially influence the process in good ways. Okay, cool. I was, uh, I was obviously expecting much more, and you know, it, it did something. So I can carry on running that. Uh, it's, I did it in a way that uh, it uses publicly available data and runs it through a crypto thing to generate the list. So you can check whether I'm cheating, and uh, uh, yeah. So it's not just me picking people that I like to nominate people. Okay. So is the person? Is this? Our yes. Do I yes, need to yes. turn it on, or is it? Can you hear? Yes. No. Okay. So is the first person who ever term limited out after that resolution was in? You can certainly take everything I have to say with you know suitable quantities of salt, but. I'm actually, I, I actually get really concerned when I hear people talking about diversity without having some sort of really specific set of objectives or some specific problem they're trying to solve. I too would love to make sure that the technical committee remains or becomes even more a sort of a representative swath of the project. But I get worried if you start worrying about, you know, gender or skin color or you know, make files over drag and drop because while those are all good indications of whether, you know, they're, 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 they're markers for whether it's diverse enough, that none of them are actually sort of the point. So don't get, don't beat yourselves up too much and if somebody really great is available and wants to contribute and would have something to add, don't be too hung up about it if they happen to be, you know, old and white or something and no, 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 please don't look at me. I, I wouldn't be concerned about us being hung up about that. I mean, of course, people have to be competent and good people regardless of, of their, their sex or their skin color or whatever. Uh, but if we can increase the diversity, then there is absolutely value in that. And there is an important point about self-selecting. So we have an in inherent bias in the process that as a body we select other people to join us, so we are more likely to select people that are like us. So we need, we need input from people not like us if we want them to be considered. At, at least for, for me, I think it's more interesting to encourage people to apply without a fixed set of prerequisites. I think that's what I want to push, rather than saying, oh my god, we have to fi find a random Node.js developer and get them on the technical committee by the end of the day. <laughs> well, apparently we did that already, because here I am. <laughs> but uh, and I'm pretty random, so. So um, another point we wanted to get across also is that we are, but I think we told that already, we're, we're normal. We're just developers, so <laughs> come talk to us if you have worries, questions, or else. I mean, we are not like, um, I, I, I think I, t I talked to someone the other day, and he was like, oh, but I'm, I'm not in the same high spheres as you are. We're not in the high spheres at all. We're just developers with a duty to solve complicated technical problems or social problems, and it's, it's not a high sphere at all. So come to us. We're, we're normal. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hello. Can you hear? What are the lifestyle impacts of being in the technical committee? Uh, what was that? Not all issues are like system D, was my... <laughs> no, but it's a fair question. So, yes. Uh, it's very spiky because we don't get... It's not like a regular thing that you have to do the same amount of work every day, every week, every month. like. Suddenly, we get a bug report that is super hot, and, and in three days, we get 100 emails, right? And you need to be able to read those 100 emails in those three days, 
or you are left behind. Uh, but then nothing happens for two months. So it's not something that you can like plan to spend a certain amount of energy every day. You just need to like have a window where you will do that work. And it's, and it's also quite heavy is maybe not a good word, but it's, it triggers a lot of reflections and it's writing the email at the end of the ref reflection is the easy part. But it's, it, you spend a lot of time thinking about what you will write and how you will write, also because the process is public. So it's, and by definition, all the issues that come to the TC come at a point where it's often late. Uh, so there is a lot of untangling to do to actually understand the problem and understand the issues at, at stake. So it's, it's quite some energy, but it's also rewarding in the sense that we help fix some problems, I think. Thankfully. <laughs> if there are no other questions, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll just finish the slides so that we can get to the bar after that. After, after that. Um, so we're also looking into ways to improve the process, um, the recruiting process, as well as the, our general bug handling process. Uh, but I don't remember exactly where I had that slide, so I'll just go to the next one. Um, so. Our current discussions that are not bug specific, um, we actually just had this one uh, the hour before, is how quick we can be. And we were actually surprised both ways. Uh, for some issues, we thought the system D, for example, we thought, oh, that took a year. Actually, it only took six months. And for other issues, we thought, oh, that took multiple months, and actually it took only one. So we have a weird understanding on, of how long uh, we take to actually decide, and actually we are faster than we thought on multiple ones. So we have became better, and uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll let Sam enhance. Sorry, were you done with your comments? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but I, um, I think an important thing to understand is that typically it takes for, uh, um, the, the t you, should, you should not be surprised if it takes the TC multiple months to respond to an issue. If, to, to, excuse me, to resolve an issue, to get all the way through. That said, um, if that timeline doesn't work for you, be honest about what your needs are at the beginning and we'll see what's possible. Sometimes um, it has been possible. I think that the shortest we produce a resolution in is five days from bug to um, to a formal resolved resolution. But that's a case where the project really needed it and where it happened that it was easy for the TC to get an internal consensus. Um, normally it's going to take longer than that, um, but you may be able to get some idea earlier in the process to help you start to move in a direction. Yeah. As mentioned earlier there as well, it really helps if you have actually your, whatever the problem is, written up well, rather than pointing us at a bug report spanning you know, three months with people being upset and personal attacks and all the bad things we sometimes see in Debian. Yeah, if you want to get a, a nice hearing from me, then really don't say, someone already addressed that point in the thread. Uh, you know, if you want to say that, then say here, and here I quote it again so you don't have to go and look for it, saying, oh, I already addressed that. You just went down about th three points in my estimation if you say that. It really pisses me off. <laughs> because I'm dyslexic, so it takes me four times as long to read this stuff as anybody else, so, you know. Myself I, wasn't, I told myself I wasn't going to ask a question at this one. Uh, we see how well that held up. Um, I was wondering about, uh, uh, to get a little bit back to um, um, a person's question over here in the corner, uh, and to link it with the uh, subjective perception of time to resolution that you guys have. I'm wondering if um, it isn't, if when you look back on something and think, oh, the, you know, the, the uh, init pr situation took a year to resolve, and this other one that we thought took two months took one, if that might not be more of um, 
measure of your level of comfort with the issue. Um, I, I wasn't around for the System D uh, init wars, but I watched them from the pages of LWN, um, and I, I read a lot of the deliberations on the subject, which is how uh, um, Russ Albury came to my attention uh, as a pretty kick-ass dude. Um, so do you think that's the, the case? And secondly, is, you, know, you, you talked about diversity. I'm trying to tie a bunch of things together here. Is the person who kind of wants to be on the technical committee, uh, don't they have to be the kind of person who's prepared to deal with spiky, high-stress um, episodes like that? And that's one area where you can't diversify into, into people who want you know, a predictable workload. Just some thoughts there. T tell me if I'm wrong. Probably am. <laughs> I'm happy to repeat my previous answer <laughs> to uh, piss Phil off. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think the thing, again, the thing about diversity is to lower barriers. So to, to lower perceptual barriers. Uh, so, and yeah, I think anybody who's been around Debian for a year or more, probably you won't be on the TC in your first year, but you never know, um, knows that there will be stress, or at least you know that there will be emotional issues that come before, right? People are invested in these things. They don't get to the TC if people aren't invested in them. So um, I don't really see that as a diversity issue? I mean, I guess we're not looking for, we're not looking to expand our complement of thin-skinned people, right? I, I guess, I, maybe I don't understand your question. Am I, am I missing something? You're saying that because, like, I, I think what I understand of your question is that this spiky workload that is associated with a lot of stress when the spike comes might deter some people, and then we get a profile of a person that is willing to put up with spiky stress. But I mean, that's kind of all over Debian, right? We have people in key positions because they're the ones who can do them and not go burn out right away. So I don't know. It's not unique. I think that's not unique to the T. You're right, but I think it's not unique to the TC. I think a lot of moderately high visibility positions within De Debian have this feature. Hi, Sean. <laughs> New policy editor. So on the, uh, on a, a hopefully somewhat less spiky uh, sort of um, thing, uh, but speaking of policy, uh, so some of the, one of the things I used to want to do when I was on the TC was to try to use the technical committee as a mechanism for resolving some of the things that are longstanding in Debian where um, they actually aren't all that hot, like nobody's really super excited about them, but the project would be better off if we would actually make a decision um, because like, if we're in some limbo land and we just sit there for forever. A bunch of those tend to land in the policy BTFs. Um, where we will never probably get consensus on a particular resolution because there are people who really would like it to work either way. Um, but the project as a whole would probably be better off if we just made a decision. Now, I was kind of wanted to get your take on what you'd feel about us starting to uh, forward more of those to the technical committee. Uh, a great example, and I, I'm just going to give it as an example and ask the room to not start talking about it because <laughs> it's one of those things that will erupt into a conversation, is that Long-standing question in Debian is if you install a pack, if you upgrade a package and the init script fails to start the daemon, do you abort the package installation or not? And there's lots of arguments on both sides of this, and some packages do one and some packages do the other. That seems like the kind of thing, and there's a policy, open policy bug. What would you all think of us forwarding those kinds of things on to the technical committee? Well, that is one of our constitutional roles, is to offer advice. So if you want advice in that issue, absolutely, come and ask us for advice and we'll come up with, we either say we have no idea or this is our opinion um, as, a, as a body and as kind of a set of developers who might have an alternate view. Um, that's certainly something we're constitutionally empowered to do and, and we'd certainly encourage that. 
Actually, we're in that case even constitutionally empowered to make a decision. Um, I think I would be delighted if you forwarded stuff like that. I would be delighted if the technical committee got more things that were, hey, we'd like you to ask you to do this rather than ever than um, then we've already gotten to a point where we're snapping each other's throats. Uh, and so I think this is a case where that could happen. Um, that said, you shouldn't be surprised if sometimes you get back, rather than a decision, you get back advice um, more than a decision. You shouldn't be surprised if sometimes you get back, we don't think that you can set policy here. The best you can do is to describe the trade-offs. Um, and that it will be a lot easier for us if you take the time to write a good report of it rather than sending us at a 10-year policy thread. Hi. So I wasn't planning to ask a question, but it, apparently it looked like I had my hand up. So I know I've got the, <laughs> no, I've got the mic, but actually as it happens, I was sort of thinking about something. Um, so over the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about um, things like, uh, are you guys familiar with uh, like things like snaps and flat packs and that kind of thing? So I was thinking about, and this was prompted by, thank you for sitting around Cosmo, Cosmo's talk earlier today, um, whether and how much we could possibly push this kind of stuff into Debian. Now this, this question can go, can probably go as deep as you want it to, as you want it to go, right? This is, it ranges from like, um, do we, can, we, can we generate these, these things from our devs and distribute them to users, which is possibly like the shallowest end of it, to can we um, provide our users access to upstreams uh, built stores by default, right? Now you're frowning, but what, I'm saying, what I want, the, the TC related thing that I want to ask you is, one, um, it feels like this is something that if somebody tried to start pushing on this, it would end up at the TC eventually. Would you want to offer advice on this? And number two, um, given that I, I forgot exactly who it was, you raised uh, a point about possibly there being a lack of like um, technical kind of diversity. You're coming from one sort of school of thought. Do you think that it would you, the TC would actually be qualified to even like give these issues proper con con, um, consideration? Given that maybe you haven't, I mean, you're not you're not sort of coming from that world. You might be coming from an old school Debian-based distro-y kind of traditional traditional world, like, do, you know, do you have some, I don't want to start this discussion now necessarily, but do you have some thoughts about whether the TC would be able to handle this well or not? I'm sure we're not ready to make a decision there. I don't I even think, have a proposal to make. I was just thinking about. No, no, but I mean, po my point is this is an area where if you were to ask the TC, can you evaluate, can you help us evaluate the technical trade-offs? and come up with a, 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 a deliverable that would look more like here are some discussions of trade-offs um, to spark some informed discussion, mm -hmm. you would get a lot further than if you said, can you set policy for flat packs? Mm. Um, I think that there probably is expert, like, I doubt I'm the only one who's, I haven't dealt with flat packs, but I've dealt with many of the issues underlying that in commercial contexts. I suspect there are other people in the TC who've, who've dealt with lots of different uh, software delivery mechanisms. Um, I think if you could get the right people together for a discussion, having some TC members involved in that discussion and producing a, a, a good discussion of the trade-offs for Debian would be a wonderful thing for the project. I think that's, that's also quite an important point, is that um, this discussion needs to happen at the project-wide level as well, probably as prerequisite, because deciding whether we enable external repositories or, repositories or not is also something we need to decide as a project, and we ha kind of have to find a consensus there before directly going to the TC to actually, take a, to, to actually rule that. That's fine. We do that like, all the time. Right. So I actually think that having the TC or somebody get the technical trade-offs together and feeding that into the broader project discussion might dis derail a lot of flaming. Like, I think that we're actually pretty close to being ready to have the discussion of, so what are the trade-offs 
for enabling reposit for enabling um, build stores by default, right? And I think that we could write up those trade-offs as an input to the project-wide discussion. And I think that that might diffuse some other things that might be pretty awful if, if they didn't have a good set of technical trade-offs as one of their inputs. So I think maybe a way to do this is to approach the TC to sort of um, shepherd the discussion in the wider, pro the wider project, because it's going to be really hard to, to, formulate a, to formulate a complete proposal and then approach the TC and then because it possibly involves so many, you know, like um, no. touching the competencies of the FTP team, the right. release team, all of the teams, right? So, so no, I don't, I don't know that the TC is necessarily going to be the best to shepherd a proposal. You think you should I, be, I think the TC would be good, again, at discussing the technical trade-offs, mm -hmm. right? That's what we do, is we look at, if you look through the system debug, for example, you will find that several people wrote some really eloquent discussions of the trade-offs. If nothing else, that was a great deliverable. I bet we could do something in a situation like this. I think that that would be a lot more feasible than asking us to shepherd their discussion or at this time asking us to rule on a policy. But I mean, again, that's my opinion. Uh, I just want to expand on what Russ said about policy team passing bugs to you guys. Um, we, this process that we have in policy to get consensus, as Russ said at the BOF yesterday, if a couple of people disagree and are not persuaded, then that process just stops. So I think, and this is often the case for these long running bugs where it's not urgent, but Debian will benefit from it being solved, which is um, how Russ put it. Um, if we were to pass that up to the TC and the response was, like with, if you took this as us asking for your advice, then that wouldn't actually unblock the situation because as I say, the process just stops if there's no consensus. Um, if you were to say to us, okay, that's not documentable, just write about the pros and cons, that's fine. Um, but taking it as offering advice when it's come from policy team because we think we're not gonna get consensus doesn't help that much and probably isn't a great use of your time, I would say. So if the policy consensus process stalls, doesn't that fit the model of all the right processes having been followed before it? Yeah, but it's 4.6.1 Does anybody in the audience know what that <laughs> means? <laughs> okay, moving on then. Um, okay, so uh, does anybody disagree that that would be a valid, I mean, I'm not saying, okay, it's hard to say, but it seems like it could be valid TC bugs yeah. for, for an actual decision. Especially if they want to send it to us, yes. Right. If you guys say, our, cons our process, we tried the consensus thing and it didn't work out, then I don't, that seems like valid to ask for an actual decision. It, as much as I hate to make work for us, but. In any case, it's something we should probably try and see if we succeed if or fail. So you can try one or two, and if the uh, result is not satisfactory, we should have a discussion again. Uh, hi. Um, talking more about the process of taking a decision, uh, the, the most of the, uh, I heard this, uh, you communicate by email. Uh, are you using like more uh, or considering using some more uh, real-time and closer communications in particular problems like going all the way from IRC uh, chats to to phone calls or maybe organizing in live meetings for a particularly bad problem because we, we all know that sometimes some some problems can be best solved only by getting the people that disagree into one room and then have somebody yeah, so, so moderate we, we, the we discussion are, we I wanted to say, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we have a constitutional limit for that. Our meetings have to be public. And so the only credible way for us to do a public meeting is email or IRC. No. Or, video. or video streaming, yeah. Yeah, one can imagine that, but that requires in-person stuff. So like teleconferences, I've tried to do public meetings via teleconferences. Um, it's very difficult to get a reasonable transcript from that. 
Um, it's very difficult to let an arbitrary number of people come and listen in. Uh, whereas with email and IRC, you have, this, you have this ability for the entire community to watch. And I think that's a really powerful part of the Constitution here. And I want to make sure we, we, uh, we respect that as, as literally as we can. It's like, I want to make sure that anybody who wants to watch the TC can come in and watch. They don't have to have uh, a cell phone that, uh, or a phone plan that can dial into a, to a, a, a European number. They don't have to have uh, magic, uh, uh, enough bandwidth on a network to be able to watch a live video stream. Um, there's a lot of constraints on, on, that puts a lot of constraints on us, and it does mean that we are somewhat constrained. But I think um, IRC in particular is a pretty powerful tool for us. Um, it makes it easy for, easier for people not using the native, uh, who aren't using the same language, aren't uh, native in the same language as being used, to read and understand and reply, because it gives that, that not quite real time uh, behavior. So you can Google, uh, Google Translate whatever parts you're confused about. Um, it makes the record exact, right? There's no conversa there are no side conversations in IRC. We don't do that. So whatever's in the IRC channel is exactly the conversation that occurred. And I think that's really powerful. But some, we, we like to meet here, um, but we don't do any decisions because we can't all, you know, trying to get a physical meeting of eight people together is very difficult. And a physical meeting of seven people with one person remote then all of a sudden you have an unbalanced meeting and that person's views won't be, uh, won't be uh, presented as accurately. So I, I think we've made a pretty good balance with IRC. I'm, I'm reasonably happy with that. Does anybody think that we need a different mechanism? You know, we could choose a, a different messaging system, but <laughs> text messages seems like, I mean, it, my children communicate solely by text messages. Uh, surely the TC can, can respond, uh, can respect what the, the modern children have, uh, have figured out. Well, there, there's one thing about um, the Constitution. We, can, we, we still have the right to handle some parts of the discussions in private, and we do that for some issues, because it's just impossible to discuss some specific person-to-person -person relationship problems in public. And I think it was a GR some two, three years ago about that, so that, we, that it, we're explicitly allowed to do some things in private, but we try to not use it too much. And that's also why here, if you see us having a discussion at DEPCONF, we don't hide in a room, we go in the cafeteria. And if you want to sit down and listen to what we say or even interact with us, please do. And it's the same for the IRC meetings. We have it monthly. Uh, I think it's the third Thursday yeah. every month on irc.debian.org. You can come. I think it's Wednesday. Well, Wednesday. It's in the agenda. <laughs> the day is secret for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, yeah, I don't I, think I, we I've ever explicitly really said, but it's fine to also interact in the IRC meeting. Yeah. So, and if, you, if it's too, too noisy for us, we will say. But if you have something to say in an IRC meeting, just come and say it. Yeah. Well, and in fact, at, at our meeting just before we met here, we had a couple of people come and sit down and watch, and I, I appreciate that. Um, oversight in any, any legislative or judicial process is really valuable. Uh, so come in and, and talk to us and tell us when we're doing something stupid, because we're only eight people. We're just eight little DDs trying to fix some big problems. And if you have input to help us, that's great. Yes. Oh, and we're out of time. Now we get to go drinking, right? <laughs> so are we really out of time? Sorry.